Support comes from Mosby Building Arts, a design-build company committed to remodeling the right way. Visit callmosby.com to get project inspiration for any room of your house. From the St. Louis Public Radio Newsroom, this is The Gateway. It's Monday, July 22nd. I'm Maria Altman, in for Wayne Pratt. Ahead, every summer, visually impaired athletes from across the St. Louis region play a special form of baseball alongside players who have normal vision. It's called beep ball. The balls beep, the bases buzz, and everyone wears blindfolds. But a person who's blind that gets around on their own most of the time has no fear to run to a base they can't see, hit a ball they can't see, feel the ball they can't see. St. Louis Public Radio's Mary Leonard takes us to a beep ball tournament. First, the news. St. Louis development officials are planning the first infrastructure projects around the future National Geospatial Intelligence Agency's Western Headquarters. As St. Louis Public Radio's Corinne Ruff reports, the city is currently taking public comment for the road and pedestrian improvements on the city's near north side. Improved accessibility and roadside amenities were part of the promise St. Louis made when pitching the NGA on its new site. Starting late next year, contractors are expected to get to work on a roughly $25 to $30 million set of projects along Jefferson Avenue and Parnell Street. Deborah Robinson lives about three blocks from the NGA West site in the St. Louis Place neighborhood. She says not everybody's happy about development there, but overall, she thinks it will be good for the neighborhood. They have not invested money in those areas for years. The sidewalks are crumbling. It's kind of dangerous because you have a lot of vacant lots. The grass is overgrown. Robinson does have a few small concerns, including how the city will find space for a planned bike path on her street. I'm Corinne Ruff, St. Louis Public Radio. Washington University geologists this fall will be a part of the first effort to study lunar samples from the Apollo 17 mission. The scientists will study the rocks to better understand how the moon, the earth, and the solar system were formed. They will also analyze gases contained in the rocks to learn more about how water exists on the moon. WashU geologist Jad Jolliffe says studying hydrogen and oxygen in the rocks could help people someday mine water from the moon. Earth has a big gravity well, and so it's expensive to launch things into space. It will be less expensive to actually mine these things and use them on the moon. NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston keeps the rocks. The samples have been preserved in a vacuum-sealed tube since 1972. Illinois and the rest of the country could soon start seeing more days of extreme heat. That's according to a new report by a group of U.S. climate scientists. Daisy Contreras has more. Illinois currently experiences at least seven days of extreme heat per year. Those are days when the heat and humidity combine to make you feel like it's above 100 degrees. But by the middle of the century, that number could rise to 40 days per year if no action is taken to reduce greenhouse emissions. Dr. Rachel Licker is with the Union of Concerned Scientists, the group who authored the report. And so those are conditions that are really difficult to work outdoors amid. That would really have implications for the bottom line of a lot of different enterprises, work schedules, worker safety. Licker says the good news is there is time to make changes. She suggests investing in more solar and wind power while reducing carbon emissions. I'm Daisy Contreras. And now, beep ball. The sport was invented so visually impaired people can play baseball. As mentioned at the top of the podcast, it's played with balls that beep and bases that buzz. Every summer, a Belleville nonprofit hosts a beep ball tournament in South St. Louis County, where visually impaired athletes from across the region play alongside players who have normal vision and accept pitchers and catchers, everyone wears blindfolds. St. Louis Public Radio's Mary Leonard reports. Anthony Easley is the first batter up for Lighthouse for the Blind. He's good at beat ball. Last year, he was the tournament's most valuable player. Easley taps his bat on home plate as the umpire barks out directions loud enough for the opposing team's fielders to hear. All right, we ready? One fold on, please. Batters up. Because Easley can't see, Pitcher Mark Adams calls out directions to him before he throws the softball with an electronic beeper. Ready, pitch. With his arms stretched out, Easley races down the first baseline toward a four-foot-tall buzzing tower. Got it safe! Yeah. 
In beatball, batters score if they get to either first or third base before the fielders find the ball. Afterward, Easley catches his breath. He's grinning. One pitch, one run. What's his secret? At the concentrate. Easley is 51. He grew up playing baseball, but he's been blind since he was 20. After a basketball game, an angry opponent shot him in the face, nearly killing him. Now, Easley works at Lighthouse, a St. Louis nonprofit that employs the legally blind. Easley says his job and this game help him keep his perspective. I was angry at one point in time, but then I had to pray about it and get my spirit right with the, with the Lord upstairs. And so he kept me around for a reason. So if the reason wasn't for to sit around and be angry at someone, you know. The beatball tournament is organized by Mind's Eye Radio. It's a nonprofit in Belleville that provides programming for people with vision loss. President Jason Frazier says area businesses and organizations sponsor the teams. You have all these people from different backgrounds, different places, some that have disabilities, some that don't, um, but also doing a, sharing this game of baseball together. Monica Tapson works for an ophthalmologist. Her team members all have normal sight. She says wearing a blindfold to play beatball is hard, and it's helped her to better appreciate the challenges that people with visual impairments face every day. Even if it gets competitive, all the teams are very supportive of each other. We're all here for the same reason, and it's a very good feeling. All of the players on the Lighthouse for the Blind team are visually impaired. They've won the tournament several times. Coach Brian Hauser says his players are fearless. But a person who's blind that gets around on their own most of the time has no fear to run to a base they can't see, hit a ball they can't see, field a ball they can't see. Like Johnny Savisky, who tackles the bases when he runs, Savisky has glaucoma and lost most of his vision 15 years ago. He says Lighthouse always plays to win, even when it's 91 degrees and there isn't a sliver of shade on the sun-baked diamonds. All these people that in, in general, that think, oh, they're blind, they can't play. See, we still count, we still matter. But on this day, there will be no trophy for Lighthouse for the Blind. After his team is eliminated in the semifinals, Savisky can't hide his disappointment. He wipes away sweat rolling off his face and says that at age 53, this might have been his last tournament. I mean, right now I'm saying, that's it. I'm done, I'll be back. <laughs> It always happens that way. <sighs> the pain goes away and then it's like, oh, I miss it already. Savisky says he'll probably be back. He loved playing football and baseball when he had his sight. With beatball, he can take the field again. I'm Mary Leonard, St. Louis Public Radio. You can see photographs of beatball at stlpublicradio.org. Our own David Casares edited that piece. The executive editor of St. Louis Public Radio is Shula Newman. Music by Ryan McNeely of Adult Fur. I'm Maria Altman, and from the St. Louis Public Radio newsroom, this has been The Gateway. Support comes from Mosby Building Arts, a design-build company committed to remodeling the right way. Visit callmosby.com to get project inspiration for any room of your house.